Good to be saved. Amen. Good to be in the house of God tonight. Pretty good crowd tonight for Sunday night. I'd hate that the rain would keep us away. I hate that a ball game would keep us away or somebody's favorite show would keep us away. I just, no other place I'd rather be than the, than the house of God tonight. I had a guy tell me, he said, it's, you know, it's, it's got to be hard being a Christian. And I said, yeah, I said, imagine trying to be a servant. You know, let, let that go over your head. You know, the Christian anymore is, is a costume. You know, we got a lot of uh, fakers and not followers of Christ. You know, it, it gets hard out there. It just feels like you just never stop. We're, we're never stopping. We're going, we're going, we're going. We got work routine. We come in here. We got work to do. Bible says faith without works is dead. Yeah. So I guess I got, well, we got some faith. We got work to do. You know, our, our, our uh, labor in the, in, the, in the Lord is not in vain. You know, it, it, it gets very hard sometimes. The Bible says, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are. Yeah, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Yep. For we have not, thank God that we have a high priest yeah, tonight. Yeah. We just don't know a high priest. We have a high yeah. priest tonight. Yeah. Tempted, tried in every single way that we are, yet without sin. We have somebody that we could go to that, that can relate to us. I'd always go to my daddy and say, son, I've been there, done that. I already, I already know that. We got a creator in heaven that came down, left his glory from above to pay the cost, pay the, pay the debt that he didn't know. You know, the Bible says too, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. They don't say the, the, the throne of benefit or the, the throne of one. It's the throne of grace. Thank God. It don't say the, the throne of a confession box or the throne of the pastor's office. It says the throne of grace. The throne of grace is on my knees. The throne of grace is in my prayer closet. Thank God. Hallelujah for him. The, I count it a joy. The Bible says cast all care upon him for he careth for us. Cast all care. Do we really understand what cast means? We like to go fish and we cast that real far as we can. You take you. You think of it as like a bow and arrow. You take it and you just let it go. Yeah. Lord, my bills are due. Here you go. Yeah. My son's on drugs. Yeah. Here you go. The divorce ain't, the divorce is coming. Here you go. Yeah. I can't get him into church. Here you go. He's, the Bible says, for all of sin, it comes short of the glory of God. You're going to fall. Fall forward. Yeah. Fall yeah. forward on your knees yeah. to the cross of Calvary. Yeah. Thank God yeah. that we have a real and living God tonight that yeah. serves us and watch over, that we serve him came down and served us when he comes back he's coming back as a roaring lion we're going to come back uh if you have your bible tonight we're going to be in john chapter number one john chapter number one and if you can please stand for the reading reverence of god's word please John chapter 1, we're going verse 1 to 5, and we're going to skip to 9 through 14. The Bible reads, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. I'll stop right there and say, many of your Bibles say, A God. This says, with God. He was in fellowship with God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was light, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended not. Verse 9, that was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came into his own, and his own received him not, but as many received him, to him gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And this is where I want to focus tonight. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, we love You. We thank You for Your holy Word, Lord. Father, we pray that You use me tonight, Lord. Lord, my lips are nothing but worthless clay, Lord, but I pray that Your Word be moved beyond this house, Lord, beyond this church, Lord. Father, we just thank you for the many blessings, the handfuls of purpose, Lord, that you let fall by the wayside, Lord. Father, bless the service tonight, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, as reading this scripture, you, you hear a lot of word and was. That's what really we want to focus on is the word was and the actual word, word. Some of our well, best well-known scripture, uh, I think a lot of us would agree that if you were to start reading your Bible, you would want to start in John 
Uh, but I will say, if you ever get going, you've got to start reading your Bible. When you stop reading your Bible, that is when doubt is planted inside of your head. You get your nose out of the book, you get the devil inside your ear. The Bible says be in season and out season. You know, that is targeted for a preacher, but I would say that's for any man or woman of God. You can very quickly put yourself out of season very quickly. I used to play football and... Uh, that was, that was our life. Since I was five years old, I played football all the way up to high school. It's, I absolutely loved it. We'd work out. We'd, we'd, we'd practice all we could throughout the season. Season come, we stop. You get weak. You get tired. When the season comes back up, you get popped. You get knocked down. You're weak. You've got to stay in shape. You've got to, you've got to keep a sharp mind. So reading your Bible won't keep the devil from attacking you. I'd argue it's going to make it even worse. The closer you get to God, the more the devil's going to be on top of you. The Bible says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You have got to renew your mind from the old self. You have got, in those two verses, you've got acceptable. You've got to present yourself acceptable. Uh, uh, to an almighty God. The Bible says also, but sanctify the Lord God. I'll stop right there. It's a problem that we got. We don't sanctify the Lord yeah. God in our hearts. Yeah. You've got to sanctify and put him apart from everything else. Yeah. I got a beautiful, nice wife. I've got to set her apart from God. My family, my job. Yeah. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready yeah. always to give an answer. Yeah. To give an answer to any man to ask if you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And I'll remind you that meekness is not soft. We might be saved, but we are not soft. A meekness is a controlled strength. And a fear is not fear of men. The Bible says there is no fear in love. When I tell you something, I'm telling you out of the fear of God that I don't have your blood on my hands. I'm telling you to warn you because I love you. Meekness and fear. The beginning of, fear, the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. The first three Gospels we see, they're uh, sub subnoctic. We've heard it before. Uh, they all three, they're together. All inspired by God. Uh, all different angles, but... John, written by John in his inner circle of uh, Jesus, he was, uh, you'll notice he's always, uh, Peter, John, and James, the transfiguration, the garden of Gethsemane. John was the last one with him at the cross. Yeah, yeah. He, uh, he, he gave John the responsibility to, to take care of his mother. Uh, the miracles you'll read in John uh, show the teaching of Christ. Uh, the other three more reveal more of his power. Uh, the incidents in John have more of an implication to teach. Uh, the woman at the well, the, he's talking about the living water, the, uh, the bread in the 5,000, the bread of life, uh, the blind man, they which uh, see not might see. If they have not seen, they might be made blind. A uh, few statistics for John 4 you find interesting. The word signs, uh, when it refers to a teaching sign, is used 17 times, 28 times combined in the other three Gospels. The word believe is used 98 times, only 29 times in the other three Gospels. Belief is often a result of the signs. People look at us for a sign. It's kind of became a cliche of mine. People are looking at you as a sign. I just said you've got to be holy and acceptable. People are waiting for you to trip up. You, you are an example. Uh, you, you can quickly and very easily hurt your testimony with just a, a, a wrong word or a bad look. I tell you what, they're looking, they're looking for anything to do. The word life is used 34 times in John, only 13 times in the other three Gospels. John's purpose and his goal for the, his readers is belief. Uh, John 20, uh, 20, 31. But these things are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and, the, and that believing ye might have life through his name. He also, he also wrote the three epistles of John in Revelation. 1 John 5, 13. These things I have written unto you, that you believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may have eternal life, and that ye may believe... On the name of the Son of God. You cannot confess until you believe. Once you believe, you trust. Well, Brother Cody, ain't that the same thing? I, I'd say that your trust is your belief in action. And we know Scripture can be very hard to understand. We're so uh, far apart from time and culture. Original writing wasn't in English. So different words translate to different things. Very deep, very, very deep meanings in these. That's why you must study your Bible and stay in your Bible. In our text... When we read the word, the well, word we know, of course, is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. But the word untranslated here is not Bible. It doesn't say in the beginning was the Bible and the Bible was with God and the Bible was with God. 
What does it mean for a person to be a word? The word here is Greek, and it translates to logos. Now, I don't speak Greek, so if I say logos or if I say logos, it's spelled the same thing. I'm meaning the same thing, the, the logos. Logos was a term that was used in Greek uh, philosophy. A very famous phrase, very famous teacher. It translates to word or theory or, or a thought. It's a divine blueprint, a thought of a divine blueprint that kept everything in order, everything in a perfect balance, and that there was something that kept all of it together. They were back thousands and thousands of years ago. They were able to make educated guesses based off of stuff happening. Gravity, you can always drop something and always drop something. It's not going to stop and take off. Your hand's always going to go down. They could make uh, predictions. Uh, Greek philosophers recognized that our universe was living and wasn't just random, but was governed by a very powerful and uh, powerful order and control. Their question was, how does it get there? You know, how we've all had that, that question of how has it got there? What have we done? And, and everybody in this room is going to admit that sometime you have had some doubt. But what always has caught, got me drawn back is you cannot explain creation. You, there's no way to explain it. We didn't come from monkeys. We didn't come from bacteria. Uh, so these Greek philosophers were very concerned they, with knowing the ultimate reality. I'm going to read for you uh, some of their theories. The first uh, to answer the origin of life was a, a philosopher named Felis. He was about 600 years before Christ. His theory was the ultimate source which, uh, which everything that exists in the universe was water. He seen everything needed water, humans, animals, flowers, any kind of seed needed replenishment. There had to be some type of germination there to be with the water. Water was necessary to, uh, to life. So he concluded that water was the most basic substance that created life. And I, I would say he was on to something, amen. Uh, he just didn't know about the living water. It just wasn't readily available yet. Another philosopher by the name of Anaximenes, Followed after him, he suggested that Thelus's theory of water being the only substance didn't go far enough. He suggested and thought, does it rain come out of the air? He suggested that water was condensed air, and air is the most basic substance of life. He concluded that everything needed air to live, so he thought air must be the source of life. According to him, air altered its state by a process of condensation. We all know that. So the steam, that's what he thought it was. The air would become more concentrated and become water. He was... He was also on to something, but we all know that breath of life that comes from God, that's where it ultimately comes from. Now, we're on the Greek. That Greek word is pneuma. It's spelled just like pneumonia. That's where we get that. That's the, when you read it in Greek, the breath of life, it's a continual breath to every single person. And I will add on and throw this in there for free. He didn't give it to animals. He gave it to men. We've got to quit putting animals on our top priorities. And I know I get up here and I say it every time. But it just gets under my skin, the time and money we put into animals. Yeah. And there's homeless people here. There's people that need our help. Yeah. They need to hear the gospel. Yeah. I'm not going to witness to our cat about a lost soul or nothing. I, I just, that gets under my skin. I just pet them, love them, don't mistreat them. But, but bless God, you know, uh, put your money somewhere else. Uh, and this, this is one of the most famous from Heraclitus. Uh, he, and his was pretty smart. His theory was there was nothing con uh, constant except change. The only thing that was happening was change. Everything and everyone is going through a constant change. He compared it to fire. He was fascinated how the hot coals went to ashes but still kept its identity as fire. He said the change itself is not the source of all things. He noticed that the change is not in conflict. Thelus and Anaximenes was looking for physical substance uh, for an answer. Heraclitus was more interested in the law. The actual principle that put this perfect form, this perfect universe. So what is behind the change and what all this in action, he called it uh, Lagos. He's the first one to say Lagos. It's what he called it. Heraclitus' theory of Lagos represents an underlying, un unifying principle of eternal law of the universe that all things change in perfect harmony. The Lagos to him came to be understood that which gave life and the meaning to the universe. And you've got to understand these, the, when this Bible was written, these Gospels, uh, the Bible was written for everybody, but at the, at the time, you know, Corinth, Corinthians was written to the church of Corinth. Uh, Ephesians was written to uh, Ephesus. They all had a, a target audience. John's gospel was written about 50 to 60 years after the resurrection of Christ. So many Gentiles had joined the church, many of them being Greek. Uh, they wouldn't understand Jewish writing. Uh, so starting with Matthew, you've got the genealogy of, of Abraham. That, that would have been foreign to them. They wouldn't have understood that. Uh, so he wrote into terms that they would understand. The, the under, they understand Lagos because they'd been around over 500 years. They had, they had understood that. Lagos to the Greek 
was understood as lifeless, impersonal force of order and personality. And here, in John's writing, the Logos is personal, and he tells that it's an actual he. And there's people today that are still trying to look for an answer. There's theories today that are absolutely ridiculous and an absolute sham to God. There's a theory by a heretic. His name's Charles Darwin that, show, that shoved down the kids of, yeah. of, of, of public schools. That's, like I said, they, we come from monkeys yeah. and that we're part of the animal kingdoms. The Bible says, God said, let us make man in our own image yeah. after our like image and let them have dominion over the flesh. So yeah. did they just, did, I guess, Planet of the Apes just happened. They took over and, and had control over the cattle and over the earth and all over the creeping that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. Yeah. Male and, let me say again, male and female created he, them. There's one gender, and they're made by God, assigned by God. God wasn't confused when he made you. God wasn't confused when you came out of the womb. You are born to what you are. We have an answer. People just don't want to read it. We'll get, we'll get to that later. So John here was given the Greeks a dominantly uh, pagan culture, their long sought after answer, that Christ was the preexistent Logos. We notice also that uh, uh, John wrote in terms notice, uh, noticeable by the Greeks, but he was also addressing the Jewish crowd. I tell you, if, you, if you study your Bible, you'll see some, stink, some things that will, blow, that will blow your mind. So relate, he was relating it back to the Torah. He starts with in the beginning. To understand Jesus Christ, you have to go back to the beginning. A lot of imagery from Genesis. Uh, creation began with God bringing light into darkness. Jesus was... The light brought into darkness. We see the word, uh, it's nature, it's, uh, it's claim of identity in the first two verses. The word was both God and with God. And with this, it, this is what I want to emphasize. The one being that created it all came and dwelt among us. If you've never heard it, if you've never understood it, the one that created it all was like me, was like you. Fingers and nose and eyes and, and felt like us. Like I said before, felt the same sorrows and pains we got. So, so you could go even deeper. The king of the world, born in a manger. Born in a manger. The, the filth of the filth. Didn't even have room for him. And then died on a cross. From low to even lower. You read the, the, the domino effect in Philippians. He humbled himself, came obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So verse 14, he became mortal just like us. So while we're on the topic of... of, of uh, another Greek word, and I don't study Greek, they just come out, they, they, they're good when you read them. The word dwelt is called skene, and it means to literally live in a tent. So now he goes from, to imagery of Exodus, of the tabernacle, the place where God dwelt with the people. Yeah. Jesus is the reality of the meaning of the tabernacle where God and the people are together. Jesus is the human tabernacle. To God. He came into the world to save us, free us, and redeem us. Suffered and died to give us everlasting life. Logos expresses his, uh, his authority and the power that he has. It expresses his deity and that you can receive him. You can, you can be given power. You can be given authority to become a son of God and have a personal relationship with him. I'll tell you what, it's enough to make, to make somebody shout. That. The creator, uh, the creator took, cared enough for his little bitty speck of dust creation to come and die for us and, and come in fellowship and, and want to be with us and want to love us. So we're getting a little bit to the message. He's always existed. Not just God, but Jesus Christ has always existed. Verse 1, he's the constant word. He didn't just come into being in Bethlehem. Jesus wasn't sent because things got out of control. You know, the Bible says, the Bible says, for as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversations received by traditions from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope should be in him. I'll say it again, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world. We got a heresy that says that you're predestinated to go to heaven or hell. The only thing that was predestinated, was the lamb slain at Calvary. You know, God wasn't up there smoking a cigarette, popping pills, talking to his therapist. Jesus Christ was slain before the foundation of the earth. He had a plan from the get-go. He's got a plan for anybody that will choose to serve him. Now, that first part, First Peter, for as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, 
Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man come to the Father but by me. The bridge to heaven goes through Calvary. The, blood, the, the, the bridge to heaven goes through the blood of Calvary. You cannot buy it. It's not a toll bridge. And thank God, it's, I don't got to worry about some of y'all. It's not a draw bridge to leave me behind. Thank God He's got a plan. He's the communion word. The Bible says, was with God. That is, He was present with God. I just told you. Let us... Make, who's he talking to? Let us make man in our image, which makes him a distinct person from the Father without reference to a starting point. The Bible says that his, his thoughts are above our thoughts and his ways are above our ways. You can't fathom a star, uh, nothing without a starting point. You've got a birthday, the day you were born, the day you were saved, the day you started your job. We have a starting point. Jesus Christ doesn't. Verse number three He's the creative word. This verse tells us that Jesus was the energy behind the creation of the universe. He spoke and it was. He stood on the edge of nothing and spoke all this into existence. The Bible says, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him, even that old nasty rotten devil. And he is before all things and him by all things consists. I believe in a big bang theory. Our big God spoke and bang, things happen. Thank God there'll never be a day where Jesus Christ never exists. No matter where we wind up, no matter what we have to face as we travel through this word, we can rest assured that the pre-existent one will always be there for us, the pre-existent word of the living God. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Now we see the Logos entered into the earth. The pre-existing word then became the personal word. Verse 14, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. He was incarnated, incarnated with a purpose. God just didn't send a delegate or a representative or some sorry ambassador. He sent the only begotten. The creator was born into his creation by the creature with a purpose to show us how to live. Logos. Where we always, which is where we also get the word logos. Yeah, yeah. When I see McDonald's, I see food. Yeah. When we see Walmart, we know it's a department store. Yeah, come yeah. On. We understand what it is. Jesus said, he that has sent me has seen the Father. Yeah. Hebrews says he's the expressed image of his person. Yeah. Who do you identify with tonight? Are you the drunken crowd? The, porn the pornographic crowd? Yeah, come on. Come on, the bar crowd? Thank God I'm part of the church crowd tonight. Yeah. Logos here, the Word, and the Word was made flesh, identifies Jesus with a, with a revelation, which we see many times in the Old Testament. Hebrews 1, verse 1 and 2, God who at sundry times and in divers man has spoken to time past and to the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by His Son. The Word of the Lord occurs 255 times in the Old Testament, always when God uh, gave word to show somebody or to show his desire to speak to us. So Jesus was the final revelation of, of himself to us. And this is where uh, we get to the main point. Because he was, he never changes, he never will change. I'm not degrading that. Because he was, my was is now changed. Because the word was Was is a past tense word. means it happened. He had to do it. We serve a God that loves us enough to give us a simple gospel and a simple plan of salvation. And he did it through himself. Jesus came to earth to fulfill the will of the Father to do the work that we cannot. When Jesus said it is finished and gave up the ghost, he meant that it was finished. There's not enough work you can do to get to heaven. It's what Christ did that was imputed to us. So he was, so we can. Point number one, I was defiled. Defiled as to means to make or be unclean or impure, such as to corrupt the purity of perfection. Now the entire human race can be described as defiled or contaminated spiritually. Being defiled makes you detract from the original nature it's a it's a attended for essentially you've got some kind of blind uh, blindness causing you to be isolated from your creator 
That's something is Satan. Satan wants you to distract you from what you created from. Why do you think you find it so hard to believe the gospel? Why do you think you find it so hard to read your Bible or even to believe the Bible? What makes you think you're too busy to attend church? What makes you believe the horoscopes and the history books, but not a gospel track? It's your wickedness and it's Satan's blindness. If you're not saved, you are serving Satan. Jesus said you cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot do it. And I'm not beating you up or trying to belittle you. I want you to hear the truth the same, uh, the same way I heard it. Everyone who is saved will tell you that it was an instant awakening. You realize how distracted you are. If you know me, you knew my love for the University of Kentucky. Football, basketball, had all the game worn and stuff. And was out in the rain like an idiot. And waiting in line for autographs. And I was. It was idiotic. I spent too much time, too much money on it. Love the sport. You can like the sport, but you should not obsess over it. Absolutely not. Do not obsess over it. It's a waste of time. So, Brother Cody, what is our purpose? Isaiah 43, 21. This people have I formed for myself. This is God speaking. They shall show forth my praise. Isaiah 30, uh, 43, 7. Even everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. You were made by God for God. To have fellowship with him. Yeah, yeah. Now it makes sense why the enemy wants you to distract him from him. Since the fall of Adam, all sin has been passed down. Ephesians 2, 3. Among whom also we all had conversation in times past in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And were by nature the children of wrath, even as some other. And by nature you are a sinner. By nature. Yeah. You, can't, you ain't going to plant an apple tree and get bananas out of it. It's just, it's just who you are. And I'll throw this in for free. The Bible says in James 4, 17, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Baptizing that baby is nothing but a celebratory bath, and you are deceiving it into hell. A baby doesn't understand what it is to have a relationship with God, and a baby does not understand what sin is. Bottom line, it's, it's just the way it is. Jeremiah 17, 9, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And I can tell you my testimony to that today. I was a nasty, wicked, hateful person. Jesus said about that defilement, that which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. For from within, out of the heart of the man, proceedeth evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, and evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these come from within and defile the man. Can a man drink bad water and get sick? Absolutely. We're speaking, we're speaking of spiritually. Your, your body is just an instrument. It's just a tool to get through here, to get to the next life. And we're just ignorant to all this. And it's a strong word, but Paul wrote that we have all sinned ignorantly. We just we didn't know what it was. Ignorance just means a lack of knowledge or a lack of awareness. We get too prideful. We get, we get too attached to someone or something. We refuse to give up something. We refuse to, we, we just got to do it on our own. We know what we're doing. In verse 5 of our text, And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Darkness is that ignorance. And those that hate truth prefer ignorance for themselves, but also try to keep others ignorant as well. Comprehend means to understand and overcome. Darkness will never overcome or overpower the light of Christ or understand the love of Christ. It's not until you're drawn by God that you understand and truly see the light. And I'll just stop there. You must be drawn in. I'm not a Calvinist, but you must be drawn in. You can't one day wake up and say, I'm going to be saved with absolutely no feeling. That's a, that's a work. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourself, that is the gift of God. Not of works, lest it man should boast. Not of works. Verse 9 says, That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. What that means, Jesus' light, his love, his promises, his freedom. It, it's God's plan of salvation. It's readily available to all. You must choose to do it. God sends nobody to hell. He, you send yourself to hell. He knows you're defiled. He knows you're messed up. He knows the devil's down your back. He knows you can't handle those burdens. He knows you're sorrowful and he knows your pains. 1 Corinthians 3, 16, 17. Know ye not that, you're, that ye are the temple of, the, of God, that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Verse 18, if you, right after that, says, let no man deceive himself. And in that chapter number 3 right there, at 1 Corinthians, Paul's talking about laboring for Christ. You've got to make sure your foundation... Yeah. Uh, is on Christ, not of silver and gold. Not of silver and gold, not what man thinks, not what the foundation 
of Christ. That there's, many, there's many souls that are still defiled and don't even know it. Don't even understand it. A lost person, uh, hopeless, helpless. Uh, their sinful condition, it renders you unclean, 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 and unable to have fellowship with God. Which goes to my next point. Isaiah 59, 2. But your iniquities have separated between, have separated between you and your God. And your sins have hid His face from you that He yeah. will not hear. I said that he will not hear. Very harsh concept to comprehend and get into your head. And you don't, and you, like I say, you don't hear it behind a lot of pulpits. Uh, It's very offensive. I mean, anything offends anybody anymore. But God does not hear you when you are unsaved. It would be hypocritical of God to answer prayers if you're living wicked. It's hypocritical. He will not do it. He cannot do it. Remember I just said you cannot serve God and mammon. Jesus, he said, no man can serve two masters. For neither he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You aren't thinking about God when you're clubbing. You're not thinking about God when you're, you can't watch your mouth, when you're going to the bar. It's only convenient to call upon God when you need him and you think he's listening. Many times we hear, I'll pray for you. I don't, it ain't going to help nothing. I, you, I mean, you bear witness with people that are saved. You know who's living wicked. It, it ain't going to help nothing. You don't believe me? Oh, well, I got some scripture. John 9, 31. Now ye know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and, and doeth the will of his, his will, him will I hear. Psalm 66, 18. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. James 4, 4. Know ye not that the friendship of the world is the enemy of a God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of a God. It's a yeah. fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Yeah. 1 Peter 3.12, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and His ears are open upon their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. He's yeah. against you. Yeah. The Bible tells us that we should be against some things too. Yeah. Psalm 96.10 says, Ye that love the Lord hate sin. Yeah. I don't want to associate. I don't want to be around it. It's not being mean. It's not judging. I'm not going to be around it. I don't want that yeah. filth on me. I don't want it around me. I'll pray for you. I'll talk to you. Hey, how you doing? I'm not going out with you. I'm not. You want to learn the Bible? Let's go. You know, you want to take it serious? Let's go. Proverbs 15, 29. The Lord is far from the wicked, but he heareth the prayer of the righteous. Brother Cody, are you righteous? No, the Bible says there's none righteous. No, not one. I'm righteous in the eyes of God because of Christ. Yeah. It's been imputed to me. And I will yeah. happily, gladly say, I am righteous. Amen. Me putting my faith and trust yeah. into that finished work and living by the will of God for my life allows me to come to the throne of grace and have my prayers heard. My prayers are heard. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Real quick, the only unrighteous prayer God hears is a true, meaningful, heartfelt, Holy Spirit-drawn prayer of repentance. Amen. And there is a difference between repentance and and remorse. You just got caught cheating on your wife. Now you want to get saved and then go back out and do it again. You know, it's putting on a show. It's, a, it's repentance. It's a real thing. It's a 180 degree turn. Point number two. Why don't he hear you? Because you're dead. I was dead. I was defiled. It made me dead. I was dead in my sins. The same condition every person is if, an out, if, if they're outside a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ today. Covered in filth. They're filled with defilement. The core of that death is that defilement. The defilement causes separation from yourself and God. I had no atonement. I had no advocate. I didn't even understand what that meant. I didn't care to know what it meant. I was dead. It was death. What do you see when you look into a coffin? The exact same thing you see of somebody spiritually dead. They're cold. They're stiff. And they're receiving absolutely nothing. The same way you, uh, you try to witness to some people that are so far in it, that it's, you, you think they're borderline reprobate or they, they're just done. Yeah, yeah. I was telling a story, Josh, witnessing before, I, before we got saved, uh, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. I didn't want to hear it. I really did not want to hear it. And he'll tell you that right now, and I'll tell him, and he knows it. Oh, boy, here he comes. <laughs> you know what I mean? As soon as that first beer cracked open, Josh was gone. But he made sure to show us some scripture and leave. I was dead. I didn't care to think about it. I didn't care. I wanted to drink my beer, get drunk, watch the game, go home, get cry, cry about getting drunk and everything else. You know, what comes along with it. Wake over with a hangover and not think nothing of it. When someone starts letting their light shine in your darkness, you start to wake up. 
Can't never give up on nobody. I thank God my, bro- my brother never gave up on us. He never, ever gave up on us. I think it probably took a year or so, maybe longer than that. It took him a while. I remember the first time we, we came to church, we sat in the back. Y'all, did, y'all had chairs. Y'all didn't have the pews yet. And I, was, I told her, I said, let's go see what Josh is talking about. And he got in there, and Josh was screaming and shouting. And I'd look over at him like it kind of embarrassed me. I'm like, what is he? Like he's screaming. What is he doing? I didn't understand it. Brother, I'd come, I'd come in here drunk. Coming here hungover, feel like I was still drunk. I'd be reading the pew books and hoping that the song, it'd be a short song. They'd pick one of them songs that had four verses in it. Brother Sonny wouldn't yeah. shut up. You know, and I couldn't get out of here quick enough. But you've got to plant the seed. You've got to plant the seed. Sometimes the fowls of the earth are going to come and devour that seed. you just got to pray and pray that that seed will find that soft, ready soil. The Bible says, I, so Paul writing, I planted a pile of water. But God gave the increase, amen. Yeah. Point number three, quickly. I was dead to God, so that meant I was doomed. Point number three, I had a death sentence hanging over my head, and I didn't phase me. John three eighteen. he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten, only begotten Son of God. I was doomed and destined for hell, and I didn't give a good rip about it. This is a spiritual death, the second death. So when a preacher gets over and we speak of the second death, or uh, if you read your King James Bible, it says death. These decaffeinated Bibles will say grave. That's very, very deceptive. Hell is death is hell. Grave is I'm going to sleep. If we're going to sleep, you're going to just party it up. You know, there's no, re- re- no reward to it. We'll get to that in a minute. The Bible says for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. You get paid for going to work, you're going to get paid for your sin. If sin was... If sin was uh, if he demanded payment on sin immediately, you know how good this world would be. If he demanded that you pay your sin immediately, you realize how in order and how holy everyone would be. But the gift of God through Jesus Christ the Lord, he took it for us. The Bible says also, for whosoever was not found written in the Lamb's Book of Life, was, it happened. John seen this, it's a revelation. Was cast into the everlasting lake of fire. Was cast into the everlasting lake of fire. He saw that. By the grace of God, my life wasn't ended abruptly. Being spiritually dead was my condition. Being doomed was definitely my fate. The Bible makes it clear that there's a limit to patience and calling to the lost uh, to, for him to, uh, to come to him for salvation. The Bible says that the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering toward usward. And not, not willing that any should perish, but all come to this is your verse. This is what I use when people ask me, Brother Cody, why is there so much uh, why is there so much evil in the world? Why is there so much death? Why is there so much hatred? God is long suffering. He's patient. He's waiting. He's giving you time. But on the same hand, Satan is here too, doing the same exact thing, trying to keep you away. That's the easiest thing. That's the number one question you get asked as a Christian. Why why does God allow this? Why does God allow that? Satan has a rule too. It's, he's long suffering, waiting for you. Second Thessalonians 1, 8 through 9. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished. Punished. There's a reward, that, that, that long suffering, there's a reward. There has to be a reward. If there is no free will, then it's predestinated. We're not predestinated. So there's a, there has to be a reward and a punishment. There's a punishment. With everlasting destruction of the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. So conclusion, it is a dangerous thing to delay coming to the Lord. Psalm 9, 7, but the Lord shall endure forever. He hath prepared His throne for judgment. The Word was made flesh and made a way out. The Creator of the world wants to have a relationship with us. Jesus came so we don't have to be eternally separated from Him. And you will be if you do not get right. It's a very fearful thing. It's a point that a man wants to die, but after this judgment, every one of us will stand before the Lagos. Every one of us will stand before Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is going to be the one judging us. And bless God, I tell you, sometimes I just told you, I get in the flesh and I'll think of times and my wife will say, you know, things we've done and I, I just tremble standing before the, the maker of the universe. But I get reminded of the blood of Jesus Christ that washes away the dirtiest, or the nastiest, most vile transgressions. The Bible says, "Cast far east is from the west." Redemption is God's ultimate plan for us. Redemption, and it took the blood of His only begotten Son. 
I was defiled. I was dead. I was doomed. The pre-existent word became personal and took my place on the cross and made a way out and a way to get a, a, a way for an easier life while we're here on earth. Uh, piano player will come up. All because the word was. W, W-A-S. W-A-S. I was wretched, wanted, and weak. I was alienated and alone. I was shameful, sorrowful, and Satan's servant. But praise God for Jesus. Was. I'm now worthy and welcome. Acceptable and adopted. Saved, sanctified, and a somebody. I was defiled, but I've been washed in the blood of Christ. I was dead, but now I have an advocate sitting at the right hand of the Father. I was doomed, but now I'm sealed until the day of redemption. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord. Father, we thank you for your presence, Lord. Thank you for the finished work on the cross. Lord, thank you for an easy way out, Lord. It's so simple. Father, we thank you so much for your written, settled word. Lord, help us through this life, Lord. Father, bless the people here. Father, we love you so much. Thank you for being our substitute, Lord. Thank you for never letting us down as much as we let you down. Father, just help us to keep on going. Keep on keeping on. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.